Hi, my name is Mr. Barlow. Welcome to episode 24 of the VCE Biology Podcast. This episode covers part of Unit 3, Area of Study 1, and I'll be talking about biomolecules such as carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, as well as the chemical substance that's essential for the survival of all known forms of life, water. If you'd like to know more about any of the topics discussed, just click on the links that appear in the iTunes album art throughout the episode. Now molecules are extremely small, and if we want to see things that are too small to be seen by the naked eye, we need to use microscopes. Now we can also use fluorescence or staining techniques if we want to look at one particular molecule. <clears throat> so we could maybe stain one molecule in a cell and look at the way that particular molecule functioned. Recently, machines called particle accelerators, like the Australian Synchrotron in Melbourne, have been developed which enable us to see molecules in more detail than ever before. And they do that by generating this really special type of light. Now we're learning about biology here, which is the study of life. So it's important to learn about the chemical substance which is essential for the survival of all known forms of life. And it's also the most abundant compound in our bodies. I'm talking about water. Now each water molecule has got two hydrogen atoms which are joined onto one oxygen atom via these really strong bonds called covalent bonds. And covalent bonds are bonds in which the electrons of the atoms are shared between each other. So they're really strong bonds. Now if we look at one single water molecule, overall it's got a neutral charge. So it's not positively charged or negatively charged overall. <clears throat> but if we look at it really closely, we'll see that the oxygen end of a water molecule has got a really slight negative charge and the hydrogen ends, there's two of them on a water molecule, it's slightly positive. So because of these slight charges, it means that water molecules are attracted to each other slightly. So the negatively charged oxygen of one water molecule is attracted slightly to the positively charged hydrogen ends of other water molecules. Now this, this attraction, it's called hydrogen bonds and they're not very strong, but it's why water kind of stays together. Water is also a substance that exists in nature in three different states. So that's solid, liquid and gas. So you know, there's snow and ice all over the world. Uh, and there's obviously oceans and rain and things like that. And in your body, there's lots of liquid water. But there's also gas because you know, water always evaporates off the ocean and forms clouds and things like that. So water is an extremely abundant chemical on Earth, but it's also the most common solvent in everyday life. So a solvent is something which can dissolve things in it. So for example, if I've got sugar and I dissolve sugar in water, water is the solvent, and I end up with a water solution. So substances that do dissolve readily in water are called hydrophilic or polar, so sugar would be hydrophilic, and substances that do not dissolve readily in water are called hydrophobic or nonpolar and maybe, you know, butter or some kind of fat would be hydrophobic. Now I said that water molecules have an overall neutral charge. Well, water also has a neutral pH, which means that it has a pH of 7. So pH is a scale which tells you how acidic or basic things are. And pH goes from 0 to 14. And pH values below 7 are acidic. For example, hydrochloric acid has a pH of 1 and pH values above 7 are basic. For example, bleach has got a pH of about 13. So interestingly, urine is slightly acidic. It's got a pH of 6, so that's you know, below 7. And blood has got a pH of, or oh, it's a little bit over 7, so it's slightly basic. And in fact, the pH of body fluids are kept relatively constant all the time. So that's water, but now I want to talk about organic molecules. So organic molecules are basically chemical substances containing carbon. So basically anything, anything that's got carbon in it, except for, there's always an except, except for oxides like carbon dioxide, carbonates like calcium carbonate, and bicarbonates like sodium bicarbonate, which is bicarb of soda. So generally organic molecules are big too. So, you know, carbon dioxide is not a very big molecule, it's just CO2, three atoms. So organic molecules often have lots of atoms in them. And there are four main types of organic molecules. They are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. 
And these molecules are often large polymers, which are made up of smaller subunits called monomers. For example, carbohydrates, the monomer of carbohydrates is sugars, and these sugars join up together to form polysaccharides like cellulose or starch. Um, proteins, the monomer of proteins is amino acids, and these join up together to form proteins or polypeptides. If we look at lipids, the monomer of lipids is fatty acids, and these fatty acids, the monomer joins up together to form polymers like fats, lipids, or the um, phospholipid bilayer of cells, so the membrane of cells. And nucleic acids, the monomer is called a nucleotide, and these join up to form nucleic acids like DNA or RNA. <laughs> so now I'll talk about the four main types of organic molecules in a little bit more detail. First up, carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are organic compounds made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And carbohydrates containing one sugar unit are called monosaccharides. And if there's two sugar units joined together, they're called disaccharides. And monosaccharides and disaccharides are also called simple carbohydrates. But when many sugar molecules join together, they form a polysaccharide. And polysaccharides are also called complex carbohydrates. So for example, glucose is a monosaccharide, and glucose is the energy source in plants and animals. Um, sucrose is a disaccharide, so sucrose is in fact the stuff you put on your breakfast cereal, cereal in the morning, so it's just table sugar. Um, some polysaccharides or complex carbohydrates are starch, so that's the stuff in potatoes, and cellulose is a polysaccharide, and that's the structural component of cell walls in plants. So now proteins. So there are thousands of different proteins in every single cell of your body and they've all got a special function. All proteins have got nitrogen, carbon and oxygen and some contain sulfur and phosphorus. Now proteins are really large complex molecules and they're built of amino acid monomers or subunits. Now there are 20 standard amino acids. Interestingly, humans are unable to make all 20 amino acids in our bodies, so we must eat nine of them in food. So these nine are called essential amino acids and they're essential because you've got to eat them or you die. Um, all amino acids have got the same general formula, but each amino acid has one part of its structure which is different from the other amino acids, and this is called the R group. Now, two amino acids can join together, and they do this via a peptide bond. And when two amino acids join together, they form a dipeptide. But many amino acids can join together in a long chain, and this is called a polypeptide chain. You know, it's a, or it's a protein, basically. And proteins can contain thousands of amino acids that fold into very different shapes. So the shape, or the structure of a protein, is described at four different levels of organisation. The first level is the primary structure, and this is just the order of amino acids in the molecule. So some amino acids are alanine, lysine, uh, glycine, uh, serine, cysteine. So if those were all in a chain, that would be the primary structure of a protein. The secondary structure is the local 3D folding, which is formed by hydrogen bonds. And there's three main types of secondary structure. There's alpha helix, beta pleated sheet, and a random coil, and one long um, polypeptide chain could have um, some alpha helix, some beta pleated sheet, and some random coil along the one chain. The tertiary structure is the total folding of the protein, and the total folding can be held together by hydrogen bonds or another type of chemical bond, which is ionic bonds. So that's the way it all folds together in a bit of a blob, I suppose. And the final level of organization is the quaternary structure. And this is a structure consisting of two or more polypeptide chains. So sometimes you'll have one polypeptide chain forming one protein, but sometimes you'll have maybe two or maybe four um, polypeptide chains forming one protein. And that's the quaternary structure. Now different proteins have many different functions. For example, structural proteins can provide structural support to tissues, um, enzymes are proteins and they make chemical reactions go faster. There are contractile proteins and they help muscles move. Uh, immunoglobulins help in the defense against disease. A type of protein is a hormone which you probably know regulates body activity. 
there are receptor proteins and they respond to some form of stimuli and there are transport proteins and they carry other molecules around the body. Also, with some proteins, the chains of amino acids conjugate or join together with other groups to form what's called conjugated proteins. For example, if one um, polypeptide chain joins together with a nucleic acid, it would form a nuclear protein. So that's a type of protein which consists of a molecule with protein and nucleic acid conjugated or joined together. And finally, just like you may have heard the word genome, genome is the full set of chromosomes or genes in an organism. Well, the proteome is the complete array of proteins produced by an organism. And the study of the proteome is called proteomics. And that's just a bit of a developing field, I suppose, but it's becoming increasingly important to our understanding of biology. Now, the third type of organic molecule I'll talk about is lipids. So lipid is the general term for fats, oils, and waxes. And lipids are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they contain relatively little water. And in fact, the lack of water in the molecule means that they carry much more energy per molecule than any other kind of compound found in either plants or animals. Fats also have little or no attraction for water and are insoluble in it, so they don't dissolve in it. And this means that they're called hydrophobic molecules. Now, a fat molecule is actually made up of two different kinds of molecules, fatty acids and glycerol. For example, a triglyceride has three fatty acid molecules attached to a single glycerol molecule. You know, tri means three, just like tricycle has three wheels, while a triglyceride has three fatty acids. Um, a phospholipid has two fatty acids attached to a glycerol molecule, and you may have heard of a phospholipid bilayer, and that's the cell membrane of all cells. So it's, that's formed from lipids or fats. Now the last type of organic molecule I'll talk about is nucleic acids, and there are two kinds of nucleic acid. There's deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, and that's located in chromosomes in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. And there's ribonucleic acid, or RNA, and that's formed against DNA. So DNA acts as like a template for the formation of RNA. Now the genetic material, DNA, that's a polymer of nucleotides. So nucleotides are the subunit of the polymer, and each nucleotide unit has three parts. It's got a sugar part, or deoxyribose, it's got a phosphate part, and it's got a nitrogen-containing base. And there are actually four different kinds of nucleotides because there are four different kinds of bases. The four different bases are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And those four bases are abbreviated to the letters A, T, C, and G. Now each DNA molecule contains two chains that bond with each other because the bases in one chain pair with the bases in the other. So the base A pairs with the base T and the base C in one chain pairs with the base G in another chain. So these bases A and T and C and G are said to be complementary base pairs. So the two chains form a double helical molecule of DNA once they're joined together. And in fact, the DNA double helix combines with certain proteins in the nucleus of cells to form a chromosome. Now, DNA is an amazing molecule. It contains all of the instructions necessary for a cell to function. And the instructions are coded for by the sequence of the four bases represented by those four letters A, T, C, and G. So just like we've got 26 letters, which enables us to communicate in English, you know, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, J, K, L, M, F, P, Q, R, S, T, V, W, X, Y, and Z, well, DNA's got four letters, A, T, C, and G. So the instructions on DNA controls, basically controls the production of proteins. And the code operates with three letters at a time. So a particular set of three letters together in a molecule of DNA codes for one particular amino acid. For example, the letters C, C, A, code for the amino acid glycine. Now the other type of nucleic acid, ribonucleic acid, or RNA, is also a polymer of nucleotides. So RNA is also constructed from four different bases, A, G, C, but unlike DNA, the fourth nucleotide of RNA is uracil, or it's abbreviated to the letter U. 
Now, RNA also differs from DNA in that it is an unpaired chain of nucleotide bases, so it's not a double helix, and it also exists in three different forms. They're all produced in the nucleus using DNA as a template. So the three forms are, first one is messenger RNA or mRNA, and this carries the genetic message held on DNA to ribosomes where the message is translated into a protein. Ribosomal RNA or rRNA together with particular proteins make the ribosomes found in the cytosol or the cytoplasm of cells. And transfer RNA or tRNA are molecules that carry amino acids to ribosomes where they are used to construct proteins. So they're, you know, they're heavily used in the construction of proteins, you can probably gather. So that's the four main types of organic molecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And that brings episode 24 of the VCE Biology Podcast to a close. To learn more interesting stuff, head over to mrbarlow.wordpress.com. I'm Mr. Barlow, and thanks for listening.